missionary will always yes. be my own church. Yes. And I love you deeply and severely. So, I'm going to turn. Um, verse number 71 is where we're going to pin it. It was good for me to be afflicted so that I might learn your decrees. Let's talk for a little while on the thought. It wasn't what I wanted, but I got what I needed. It wasn't what I wanted, but I got what I need. Mean. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you now for this opportunity to serve and worship you. And I pray, God, that you will use me for your glory. None of me, all of you, send your precious Holy Spirit to be my teacher and my God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And thank God. Out of respect for your faith for this Women's Day, uh, stronger than the storm, bent but not broken. Yeah. I want to just work through this text a little bit. Come on. And just dealing with this whole idea that there is the presence of a storm or trouble or trial, and that even in the presence of the storm, it has had some impact on me. It has had an effect on me. Let me sleep. God bless you. Um, it has had an effect on me. But my testimony, according to your faith, is that although I am subject yeah. to the storm, right. the storm has been unable to consume yeah. me. Yes. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. There's evidence come on. Come on. that I've been in the storm. Yeah. I can't deny the activity of the storm. Come on. Yeah. But I can testify yeah. that I've had the victory yeah. over the, the, the storm. storm. Storm storms can be defined by many different things that transpire in our lives. Well, storms are defined by trials and tribulations and sufferings and aggravations. According to our text, afflictions, things that we did not plan, things wander we would not have chosen. But nonetheless, if we could have stopped it, we would have. Well, yeah. true. If we could have gone on a different way, certainly we could have. Well, uh -huh. If we could have controlled the effect or impact, I believe I'd have 100% attempted to say we would have. Uh -huh. But since we are just the meteorologists reading the storm, well, uh, come on. we realize I can only tell you about the existence, the arrival, and the departure, but I cannot tell you how to control it or how to stop it. I'm just the reporter. Yeah. Yeah. And we know that reporting the weather is really just based on estimates of what we see in meteorolo meteorological that right? a technology uh, that gives us an indication of what might potentially happen uh, at the presence and arrival of a storm. It's just a prediction based on what I see. Sometimes the meteorologists get it right, and sometimes the meteorologists get it wrong. Sometimes the government must respond to uh, the arrival of a storm to say either you need to bear down, close up the windows, board up the windows, or you simply need to evacuate. Well, they can only tell you these things based on an estimate yes. of what they believe will transpire in coming time. But none of these people are able to control the storm. They haven't created that yet. They are not able to control the storm. So then the best that we can do is to position ourselves for the best outcome over things we cannot control. Lord have mercy. It's good when I have uh, I have a report. It's good when I have information in advance because it gives me the opportunity to position myself. It gives me the opportunity to be proactive uh, as opposed to reactive. And I often say when I'm teaching at home that that it's always good to be proactive because pro active means you got a plan in yeah. place for what has been estimated might happen. Yeah. Yeah. 
it means that no matter what comes, I've already put some things in place, like life insurance. I've already put some things in place. I never go down, but I just don't know when. But a plan, a life insurance is part of a plan to take care of things in the event it is untimely. We don't yeah. expect it. We don't know how it's going to come, how quickly, or what might transpire, or what the conditions might be applied. Uh, means that uh, it can never completely overtake me because I put some things in place to hedge my risk. I, was yeah. I put some things in place to hedge my risk. I, I've caused some situations to mitigate the impact, Lord Jesus, that you can have on me. I know I can't stop it, but I surely can mitigate how much it does to me. But the damage is, I'm putting some controls in place to control the damage that might potentially happen when I'm proactive. I can do that. Yes, yes, yes. But when I don't trust the report of the meteorologist. Well. When I don't take it seriously, when I don't really consider my life, when I don't consider those, I use in my example, bread about a dying, but I don't consider those that have to take care of me when I can't take care of myself. When I'm inconsiderate, come on here, immature, irresponsible, and unaccountable to anyone. I know those words hurt because that's not true, but come on, I've got some areas in my life, y'all not in here, where I'm still struggling and get it together. I'm still growing up, I'm still mature. And I I got all my guts in my world. We got yeah. two or three folks they really come on your wizard here to be honest about this situation. But in those times, uh, I am not proactive, but I am reactive. Yeah, yeah. And when I am reactive, that means that what has been predicted is already here, it's already happening, and now my response is after the fact. Yeah. When I'm reactive, I got to play catch up. When I'm reactive, I'm trying to load my gun in the middle of the battle. When I'm reactive, I'm trying to put boards on my windows, but the storm is already blowing. When I'm reactive, I'm losing time because now it's ahead of me, and now I've got to catch up to what is already booked out in my mind. Yeah. Somebody call me reactive. When I am reactive, and when you're reactive, you suffer more damage because you don't have controls in place. Stronger than the storm, bent but not broken. We can't be stronger if we are ill prepared. If we've not read the signs, if we've not accepted the report, if we've not looked at the red signs and realized that a deficit can be the demise of something really good. Y'all don't want to see us. A deficit is not something you can overcome simply by taking it lightly, but we've got to change what we're doing. And some change is critical change, some change is time sensitive change. Some change is going to make you uncomfortable. Some change is going to cause you to have to be honest about what you're looking at. Yeah. 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 Amen. This Psalm 119 uh, is a very powerful psalm because it speaks of the psalmist's relationship with God. Talks about the challenges of what is transpiring in the psalmist's life, but it also talks about the psalmist's response to the things that are happening. The Bible says in verse number 65, do good to your servant according to your word, Lord. The psalmist is talking to God. How often do you talk to God? How how often do you make a plea before God? How often do you tell God that you love him? The psalmist is making an appeal to God about doing good toward him according to his word. He's not praying on this. He's not asking for houses and land. He's not asking for what will make him feel good. But he said, God, I want you to be good to me according to what you have already said. Lord, have mercy. I'm calling you on what you have already put out according to your word. Teach me knowledge and good judgment, for I trust your commands. Now, 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 I can read this and look at it and realize that that there is a level of faith that the psalmist has in the ability and the words and the promises of God. Yes, God. Because in his prayer, in his conversation and communication, he's not devoid of who God is. He's not 
devoid of the characteristics of God, and he's only trusting and showing forth his faith in God by asking God for the things that God has already promised. He talks about his faith in verse number 66 because he says, I trust your commands. Amen. I'm not asking you for something, but I don't trust in what I'm asking for. I trust in what you have already said, and because I trust in what you have commanded, then that qualifies me for a response. It is difficult to continue in salvation if you lack faith. Come on, Jesus. If you lack faith in the God who has control over your salvation. I didn't just give my life to God, but I trust God. Yes, God. I didn't just say that he is the Lord over my life. I yield and submit for him to be Lord over my life. And I don't just submit when times are bad. I don't just submit when there's a brewing storm. But I submit even when times are good. Because even when I'm not good, God is still. I wish I had an honest church that, that can go on and confess that God has been better to me than I've been to myself. Uh, there have been things that God has blessed me with that haven't even prayed for. God is good. Even in my darkest states, my lowest state, my deepest state, God was still God over my life. He loved me in spite of myself. God is good. Anybody in here can testify that even when I wasn't thinking about it, when I was calling on him, when I was doing me, come on, Stella, I don't know that. When I was getting my groove on, God was still good. I wish I had trust that understood that God is still good, even when I don't deserve it, even when I'm not looking at him, even when I don't know his name, even when I'm walking in the opposite direction, God won't testify. God is still God is still good. So the psalmist says, I trust your command. Yes, yes, yes. He says, before I was afflicted, I went astray. Yes. Now, I would have looked at that verse number 67 because it's so important for the support of verse number 71, which is the basis for the sermon. Because in verse number 67, he talks about his relationship with affliction. He talks about the presence of affliction and the lack of a presence of affliction. Well, break it down. Affliction is something that impedes, injures, harms, makes us uncomfortable, causes suffering uh, that, that we cannot get out of. Affliction. It's not what we expect and it's not what we plan. We don't put it on the schedule, but affliction often arises unplanned, unscheduled, and catches us off guard. Yes. Yes. Causes heartache, discomfort, yes. depression, affliction, yes. suffering, and troubles. But if we understand our, our relationship with, with affliction, we'll be able to see it from a different perspective. Yeah. Yeah. The psalmist says, let me help you with your view of affliction. Well, uh -huh. He says, before I was afflicted, uh -huh. when I was afflicted less, that makes sense. Uh -huh. Come on now. When I was without affliction, uh -huh. he said, I went astray. Uh -huh. Before I had suffering, before I had struggle, uh -huh. before I had a threat on my life, yeah. before a diagnosis of cancer, yeah. before the loss of my spouse, uh -huh. before I was afflicted with something that would stop me, uh -huh. cause me to give my undivided attention to it, before I had been impeded with what I could not understand, what I could not describe, what took my breath away, what caused me to almost lose my mind, what caused me to want to give up and walk out, that caused me not to wake get out of the bed in the morning, before I understood this level of pressure and affliction, I went straight. Come on, come on, come on. Yep. Make it blind. Make it Which blind. tells us that affliction has a very unique role in our lives. Yes. <laughs> I like that. Affliction has a way of keeping you Hallelujah, Pastor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
keeping you in line. Yeah. Affliction makes it so that you don't lose your way. Right. And I know many of us, we go to hollering and crying and whining and complaining at the very presence of affliction. Because nobody wants to be uncomfortable. Nobody wants to hurt. No one wants to feel lost. No one wants to feel left alone. No one wants to feel thrown away. No one wants to cry. No one wants to feel like their heart is broken in a million pieces. No one wants to feel like their life will never come back together again. But when affection comes, if you can see affection as something that causes you to stay in the presence of God, you'll roll out a welcome man. Lord have mercy. He said, before I was afflicted, I went astray. But when affliction came, I learned to obey. He said, before affliction came, I went astray. Uh -huh. But when affliction came, I learned to obey. Now, I'm black. I've been black all my life, right? Yeah, yeah. So I understand that some of us got to repeat classes over and over again because when affliction comes, we say, we holy go still, fire that time, running to the altar, bowing down, worshiping God. But as soon as he lifts the lever off your life, you will get that book. You forgot what the affliction felt like. You you forgot how your heart was broken. You forgot that it was God that rescued you. You forgot that God answered your prayer. You forgot that God in the pardon of your sin. You forgot. He uh -huh. said, boy, that affliction made me obey. I was honoring. Come on here. I was ignorant. Y'all don't want to see. I, I, I didn't get exposed until so I went back and did it again. Y'all don't want to shoot me right here. But, but now that I understand, come on in here. He said, I needed affliction. Because that was a piece of work. I wish I had somebody in here who understood and willing to testify. I was a piece of work. Matter of fact, I'm still a piece of work. That's why I keep going through. That's why I'm still struggling. Because I'm still. This ain't the free church, Reverend Slate. This ain't the free church, me and you and me. Uh, 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 so some of us are complaining because we're still going through and we're still struggling. But if God took his foot off your neck, you would be a whole mess. <laughs> what we have to realize is. It's not what happens to us that matters. It's how we respond that makes the difference. It's not the details of your affliction that matters. It is how you respond. It's how you respond to the presence of affliction. When I was younger, when I suffered through stuff, wow. I cried and rolled around on the floor. I struggled with depression. I called anybody who would listen. My every conversation, brother drummer, was about my affliction. You can talk to me. I found everything on TV was related to my affliction. There was nothing going on in my life but my affliction. My response that allowed it to consume me. It consumed my mind. It consumed my action, it consumed my behavior, it consumed my attitude, talk about me and talk about you, it consumed everything, caused me to be bitter, caused me to be broken, couldn't love nobody and nobody could love me because my response to affliction allowed it to overtake me. But it's not the details of the affliction that matter. What matters is your response to the presence of affliction. All right. Just like the storm, what matters is your response to the storm. Yeah. Whether you are proactive or whether you are reactive. The writer of Psalm 119 had a lot to say about his trouble and evidently he had suffered so much that he became somewhat of an expert in dealing with affliction. Yeah. Because by the time we find him in Psalm 119, somewhere around verses 65, 66, 78, all the way down, we see that he had a different outlook That's it. That's it. about the presence of affliction. He's the grown up Cynthia, right? He's the mature Cynthia. He's the one who realizes the affliction didn't come to kill me, it came to grow me. The trouble didn't come to cancel me. The trouble came to get me a place for what God needed for me to do. And so, so, so we gotta understand that your trouble has a purpose. Your 
corporal has an assignment. Your profession has a purpose to walk something good out of something that showed up and looked bad. That's why the writer says, come on in here, he calls it all things. To walk together. For your good. I feel my heavy All of a sudden, we 
hearing God clearly. Yeah. We've got to realize that your afflictions uh, allow by God to bring you back into his presence to give you a wake up call. But he says here, during my troubles, uh, he says, during my learnings, it was good for me to have been uh, afflicted. Yeah. As much as I didn't want it, as much as it wasn't the plan that I had, as, as much as I realized now I went in the wrong direction, as much as I wanted what I wanted, but I didn't want what I got, as much as I thought I was doing what I needed to do, I realized now that it wasn't what I needed after all, but the outcome caused me pain and affliction, and this affliction wasn't good, but it was what I needed. Yeah. Yeah. Strong and strong, big but not broken. You don't get big, come on in here. Uh, unless you have somehow been afflicted by the presence of the storms in your life. But I came for these last little five minutes right here to make this deposit. I'm going to sit down because I'm sweating my brains out. I just want y'all to understand something. If you don't take anything else from this sermon, I need you to get a different perspective. I need you to understand that you need to stop asking God to get you out of what you are already in. Because through the process, God is going to do something in you that good days can bring to you. God can maybe do something for you that feeling all right, what we're going to do for you. Some of us had to be bent in order to be fixed up. Some of us had to be bent over in order to be straightened up. Some of us had to be exposed in order to get our lives together. God can get your undivided attention. Come on, Oswald Chambers. God can get your undivided attention by simple nudges. But God can allow the storms to hit your life in order to get you to look up to Him and cry out, I need you. God has to put you in a predicament where you will. Oh! 
comes. Uh, because if it comes, I understand uh, that the storm can rise and let God allow it. Uh, the wind can blow and let God allow it. Uh, but he's the same God who is able to speak to the wind and the rain to tell them a good word to cease. Uh, in my life, how to cease. Uh, in your life, uh, in how to be, be still. Uh, Yes. All right. Yes. All right. So he said, 
Hallelujah. He just stretched his legs a few words right here. He said, I learned, and in my affliction, I learned your laws, your decrees. I learned the truth. In my I don't get to this outside of the affliction. I can't get where I need to be until I have submitted to the affliction. But I've got to see it for what it is. And the enemy, I've got to walk through this thing right here. The enemy wants you to keep the breath, the presence of the affliction. He wants you to keep moaning and groaning about the affliction. He wants you to keep complaining and fighting the affliction. But when you realize that the affliction has a purpose for you to get beyond what you could not get over yourself, James said, I just love this text. I use James all the time. He is funny. James said, Count it all. I better preach. He said, Count it all. Sure. When you come into the worst temptation, yeah. struggle, trials, tribulation, and affliction. Yeah. Can I take a short time? He said, because it's working for you. Yeah. That's why you can find joy and affliction, but you may not see it right here, but it's working for you. Can I take some air on my face? Because yes, yes, yes. everything folks said was no lie. Oh, y'all were the truth. But live through Because God's going to take your worst days and make them the platform for your best days. Yeah. He's going to show people that you didn't die in what you were in. Yeah. And that you were better than your worst condition. Yeah. <laughs> That's why he always used people like Orion and Abraham. That's what makes Abraham so great. That's what makes David so great. Yeah, yeah. Because the king was a mess of stuff. God is going to use everything in your life that you have been suffering with, your children, your family, all of that stuff. God's going to use it to get a glory out of It was good. I was good, good, good. because I learned the decrees, the laws of God. That last part I wanted to get to, he says, the law from your mouth is more precious to me than thousands of pieces of silver and gold. When you have survived affliction, the words that come from God's mouth become precious. Yeah. Because it was his word I held on to. Yeah. Yeah. It was his word that comforted me. Yeah. It was his word that made me not give up and lose. They become precious. And when something is precious, you can't fall. You stuff it in your bosom. You hide it in your heart. That's what the word is saying. When it's precious. Yeah. When you can open up a song and it takes you through a crying period. Amen. That word becomes precious. Yeah. It's not what I want. I want to get this thing any other kind of way. Come on. It wasn't what I wanted. But I got what I needed. I was beat, but I got wrong. And that's my testimony. And I'm sticking with it. Come on, clap your hands. Get lots of prayer. Think about it with your feet.